So there will be time for questions at the end of the conversation. You can ask your question in writing at any time during the conversation. Uh, check the bottom of your Zoom window and you'll see an icon that says Q&A. So write your question in there. There are hundreds of you watching this morning, so we won't get to all your questions, but I do hope to choose and pose a, a representative handful. So Richard Moon is Professor of Law at the University of Windsor and former president of the Canadian Law and Society Association. He's an alumnus of Trent, Oxford and Queen's Universities. His many books include Putting Faith in Hate, When Religion is the Source of or a Target of Hate Speech and Freedom of Conscience and Religion. He's co-editor of a forthcoming publication from the University of Toronto Press, Indigenous Spirituality and Religious Freedom. Uh, Richard Moon is contributing editor to Canadian Constitutional Law and is the recipient of numerous awards for academic excellence, as well as for the advancement of equity in the university and wider communities. He's a regular panelist and contributor in online TV and print media. For example, a recent op-ed in the Toronto Star on the Harper's Magazine letter. Professor Moon's research focuses on freedom of expression and freedom of conscience and religion. Amin Saju is scholar in residence at SFU, where he lectures in the School of International Studies with a focus on human rights. He has served with the Canadian Departments of Justice and Global Affairs and was affiliated with Cambridge University, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, the Institute of Somali Studies, sorry, the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London and McGill University. He's contributed extensively to the news media, including The Guardian, The Globe and Mail, CBC Radio, Asian Wall Street Journal. I mean, Sajou's books include Pluralism in Old Societies and New States, Muslim Ethics, and Muslim Modernities, Expressions of the Civil Imagination. I mean, Sajou is contributing editor of the Muslim Heritage Series, and his current research is at the interface of law, citizenship, and public religion. I will hand you over now to Amin and Richard. Thank you, Mark. Good morning and good afternoon, Richard. Um, and let me add my words of welcome to the audience to the second virtual event in our series, which, as many of you know, began in 2018. Thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, this campus event has turned into a global one, and no masks or sanitizers required to participate. On the flip, flip, on the flip side, we have a cap of 60 minutes before the system says goodbye which is a reminder of the limits of free speech. So let's get on to it. In a democracy committed to equal citizenship and pluralism, not just passive tolerance, but an ethic of active inclusion, freedom of expression seems to be everything. It can be creative and generous, critical and harsh. But we generally agree that without the space for articulation, democracy is stifled. Now, this is where Aristotle walks in and messes things up because he insisted that citizenship required some serious bonding among people, what he called philia. Often this is translated as friendship, but I think that's shallow. What worried Aristotle was that without bonding, societies would be ripped by polarization. Civil society absolutely needs philia, an ethic of civic commitment. Nearly a thousand years after Aristotle, another Mediterranean thinker, the Tunisian Ibn Khaldun, warned about the same peril of social rupture in a society that lacked what he called asabiya, the bond of social solidarity. Khaldun was not talking about religious solidarity, but about civic solidarity. Ultimately, this is what allows everyone to belong no matter their gender, sexual orientation, religion, race, color. Take it away and we have tribes, not citizens. That's what Aristotle and Khaldun were afraid of. And it sounds awfully resonant at this time. So if philia and asabia matter so much, then what happens when free expression erodes them? Now that's where the poets come in like Ogden Nash, who had this to say in 1933, when the Nazis were running rife with tribalism. Any kiddie in school can love like a fool, but hating my boy is an art. Well, I'll let you digest that. 
And meanwhile, I can hardly think of a better qualified Canadian to take us through the ins and outs of free expression and hate speech and how religion fits in than our guest today. Last year, as some of you will recall, when my onstage guest on freedom of religion was Professor Benjamin Berger in Toronto, and we spoke about the ins and outs of that freedom, Ben and I at the end said to each other, we absolutely have to get Richard Moon into this conversation. And now here he is with my deep appreciation for taking the time from his heavy schedule in Windsor. Welcome, Richard. Thanks so much. Uh, I mean, and thanks so much for inviting me and including me uh, in this. I'm just delighted to be part of it. Well, it's been fantastic to have you on screen, though we're sorry we can't have you in Vancouver, which is what I had been hoping. Um, let me get to our, our um, first question, which is really about what we mean by expression. It, it can, of course, be written or oral. It may be artistic. It may even be body language, such as what you see on the screen, uh, taking the knee, um, maybe a peace uh, sign or even giving the finger or the black power salute. And some regard it as the very basis for exercising other rights. Now, Richard, why is, such, why is freedom of speech that important? And personally, how did you get into this particular field of law and its politics? Yeah, you warned me you're going to ask me a, a personal, uh, you know, question how I got into this. And I mean, I think my, you know, my simple answer to that is I don't really remember anymore. But what I will say is I recall when I was 16, I joined the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. And whatever it was, I had an interest at that stage in my life. And I, in fact, I grew up in Guelph and I remember taking the bus down to Toronto to attend the annual general meeting at the time. And I suppose uh, since then, perhaps before, but certainly since then, um, it's been uh, a real interest of mine. Religious freedom, equality rights and uh, free speech. Okay, now the, the substantial part of your question really has to do with why it matters and what it is. Mm -hmm. And I would say that my, my thinking uh, about freedom of expression begins with a pretty basic observation that it, it protects a social practice. Because often when we think of rights, we think of the individual's liberty, the individual's uh, right to be free from state interference. But freedom of expression is not simply that. It in fact protects the individual's right or freedom to participate in a deeply social practice to engage with others through communication. And I think a lot follows from that and maybe in the course of um, the next hour, we can explore some of the implications of that. Um, but I think the important recognition is that we become individuals capable of thought and judgment when we um, join in conversation with others, when we participate in collective life. I think some of your early, your observations, the introduction were pointing to that idea. Our thoughts and our feelings take shape in linguistic, when given linguistic form, when we express them in language and put them uh, and present them to others. I also think through communication, uh, we're able to participate in various collective activities like the development of knowledge or self-government and so forth. Now, the other part of your question is, well, what are we talking about when we're talking about the protection of freedom of expression? And in most simple terms, we're talking about communication. And you mentioned a variety of forms in which that could take. Um, and when we talk about communication, and I think the courts have said this, we're talking about an act that is intended to convey meaning or communicate a message to another. So it's a relationship of sorts. And I think that's critical. And of course, we can do that in many different ways through a variety of um, socially created languages, as you described. And I think critical to understand communication is a recognition that the individual is seeking to convey meaning to an audience and does so in a sense by signaling to the audience that's what they're aiming to do so that the audience will see the act, whether it's um, spoken a written word or a gesture, it will see the act as intended to carry meaning and try to understand that act. So as soon as we call something art, for example, we are signaling uh, to an, the audience 
that they should look, you should look at it as something that maybe carries meaning in some way to reflect upon it. I, I, often... I really like that. Sorry, Richard, I, I really like the way you've contextualized it. And I want to, that I want to focus in on, on something that you just said, which is that especially whether it's art or whether it's, it's direct conventional expression, here in Western liberal settings, we tend to see freedom of expression as secular, as emerging from a civic culture, which we tend to think is separate from, say, a religious culture. And this means that the state itself must be neutral between religious traditions. Yeah? So you quote in your book, Freedom of Conscience and Religion, the Supreme Court of Canada in the famous SL case in 2012, um, religious neutrality is now seen as a legitimate means of creating a free space in which citizens of various beliefs can exercise their individual rights. Okay. Now, in practice, Richard, all states have a religious history, which they reflect here in Canada. We have a robust Catholic and Protestant legacy. If you're in Britain, you have the Church of England. Even in Russia, you have the Orthodox Church. So if the state must, in the name of neutrality, distance itself from particular religions, surely it's not neutral between religious and non-religious positions. It's taking sides. So where does this leave freedom of expression as a secular ideal, as you understand it? Well, okay. I mean, let, let, me, let me focus on the, um, the central claim about state neutrality towards religion. And then right. we could think about other dimensions of that. And maybe I can put this in the context of what the courts have had to say about the constitutional right to freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. So certainly in the early cases, uh, that came before the court dealing with freedom, freedom of religion, the court framed the right as a liberty. They described it as the right, the individual to engage in, participate in religious practices and not to have religion, uh, not be compelled to engage in a religious practice. So it was understood as a liberty. In subsequent cases, the courts have expanded on that and perhaps taken the freedom in a slightly different direction, as you, you've mentioned. Uh, the court talked about freedom of, they talked about freedom of religion as requiring the state to remain neutral in religious matters. The state should not support or prefer the practices of one religious community, and it should not restrict religious practices unless it has a good and strong reason to do so. Now, this is often, I guess, what we mean when we talk about the separation of religion and state or church and state, mm -hmm. that religion and or religious contests should be excluded from politics, or religion also should be insulated in some way from politics. Now, of course, from that comes the concern you noted, where a number of individuals say, well, if religion is excluded from pol political decision making or from politics in this way, it appears then that there's not neutrality. What we have instead is support or affirmation for a particular worldview, a more agnostic worldview. Exactly. Yeah. And I think there's an answer. I think there's an answer to that. And I would say, importantly, the Canadian courts have not applied the neutrality requirement in a, in a kind of thoroughgoing fashion. First, let me note that they've said that the state can support religious institutions like religious schools if it does so in an even-handed way, if it supports religious schools from all different groups and ensures there is a non-religious alternative. That's one way in which there need not be a complete separation. Secondly, the courts have fully acknowledged that religious practices, religious belief systems have played a large role in, you know, in, our, in the country and are reflected in a, a variety of ways. And nobody imagines or expects that we're going to sandblast every indication or sign of religion uh, from our historical record. Well, in some societies, they might want to do that. Well, I, I know that. I, I realize <laughs> that. And so, in fact, there's an a willingness to acknowledge and recognize that, in fact, um, there are indication signs of you know, our historical mm -hmm. religious origins. Very few people, there may be some, argue that we should go up and cut down the cross on Mount Royal, for example, uh, even though it might seem like an affirmation of a particular religious view. Uh, 
And finally, I think the most important thing, and this is something that's probably hard to um, elaborate in this particular context, is the courts have indicated that religious values, when religious beliefs address civic concerns, and all religious belief systems have invariably have something to say about what is a just society or what counts as human dignity or proper respect for humans. And as a consequence, religious beliefs then often say something significant about how we should organize or order our society. And our courts have said that religious beliefs addressing civic matters can play a role in public decision making. Now, if that's the case, then of course we have a lot of challenges in figuring out what it is the state's supposed to be neutral towards, religious practices of different kinds, and what in fact can play a role in public decision making. Right. Religious values dealing with questions of say homelessness or abortion or matters of that kind. Okay, so, that, that's, my, that's, my, point, my point being that there is no demand that the state be neutral in relation to all dimensions or aspects of religion. Mm. And so it, it's, it's very much a diluted neutrality. Sorry, sorry. It's very well, much a diluted form of neutrality, isn't it? Well, diluted or at least selective. I mean, for it to be manageable or understandable, it cannot apply to every element of religious, a religious belief system. All right. So one, one area where this is really controversial is, is this idea of being gay in practice as opposed to having, say, a passive gay identity. So the federal government asked the Supreme Court of Canada whether redefining marriage, you, you see the, the key question on your screen, whether redefining marriage to include same-sex relationships would violate the Canadian Charter of Rights because this would impose a new ethos on those Canadians who believe that only traditional male-female relationships were moral. Furthermore, it would compel religious officials right, churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, to perform same-sex marriages, even if they found them offensive. Now, the court responded no to the first question, that, that the equality of gay and traditional relationships did not violate freedom of religion. But it said that requiring religious officials to perform same-sex marriages would violate the charter. Now, Richard, you say, um, in your book, that this involves um, that this involves repudiation of a religious belief by the state, i.e., the traditional belief. But the law is not the same, of course, as ethics or morality. I can respect the law prohibiting discrimination against gays, so I'm complying with the law, but still hold firmly to my moral beliefs about that, just as I would say with gambling or drinking alcohol. So the state can only make laws, it, it, it can't make morals. So how does it repudiate a private religious belief? Well, all right, you know, as, as I said a moment ago, most religious belief systems have something to say about the nature of a just society or human dignity or welfare, and that these views can and do play a role in public decision-making. I mean, the reality is that for a long time, um, same-sex intimacy was unlawful in this country. That changed in the 1960s, but that was the case for a long time. So in fact, the law did indeed reflect that particular religious view. The reality is that when the state takes a position on a public issue, its position may be inconsistent with the beliefs of some religious groups. And so when the state forbids sexual orientation discrimination, and even more obviously, when it recognizes same-sex marriage, it really is taking a position. It is recognizing that these sorts of relationships are valuable, they're worth supporting and protecting, and it rejects the idea that these relationships are immoral. Even if it doesn't do that in the language of religion, in the language of sin, it is rejecting the notion held by many religious groups, fewer and fewer, I might add, but still a number of religious groups that homosexuality is wrongful. Uh, our law has now said otherwise. As a, a political community, we have said otherwise. Now, of course, those who think that homosexuality is sinful or immoral can hold to this belief in their personal private lives or uh, within a community of other believers, um, certainly, but when they interact with others, renting, employing, um, selling goods, 
the things covered under human rights legislation, for example, they are forbidden to discriminate on the grounds of sexual orientation, even though they might consider still that activity to be sinful or wrongful. Let me give one other quick example, which I think maybe might help. Um, Anti-discrimination law prohibits um, sex discrimination, gender discrimination of different kinds. The Roman Catholic Church still, of course, um, will only ordain men into the priesthood. Now, of course, that looks like gender discrimination. Nobody is imagining that the law should intervene in order to compel or require the Catholic Church to start ordaining women as well. Obviously, a debate within the church itself is happening and continues to happen on that. But it's important to recognize that respecting the autonomy of religious organizations or the independence of individuals in their private lives is not the same as remaining neutral towards the values they may hold. Okay, let me take you up on that, because the, the impression I'm getting here is that the state may think it's repudiating something, and you're saying that, that, that it, it's governing that in the public domain, but sure. people are free in their private domain to have whatever beliefs they want. Now, yes? Sure, I mean, lots of people hold various racist views and live in accordance right. with those right. views in their personal okay. life. But sure. we don't, that's wrong, but we don't think there's a role for law necessarily to try and intervene and somehow reshape who they decide, who their friends are or family members are, whatever it might be. But the That's reverse, it. sorry, Richard, but, but the reverse could happen. So it's interesting how the state interferes with the expression of religious orientation in the name of neutrality. For example, you discussed the Quebec Charter of Values which in one form or another has been espoused by all the major parties in Quebec. And in effect, it targets Jewish and Muslim forms of expression, such as wearing the kippah or the hijab or the niqab. Now, this is our version of a European practice, which we see especially in France and Belgium. And it's defended in the name of state secularism and neutrality. Now, it seems to me that typically, the secular side will say, we can't have this, quote, irrational religious beliefs, and therefore the state needs to be neutral and secular. But I can think of nothing more irrational than the state telling people whether they can wear a turban or a kippah or a hijab in a particular context. Um, that strikes me as remarkably intrusive and irrational. And then they put in the word in, the, in, the, in Quebec law, um, conspicuous sign. Now, a Sikh turban may be conspicuous, but so is a Mohawk haircut. Um, wh where do we get off using such subjective language and then messing with, with private beliefs? So it, it seems to me driving a cart and horses through this neutrality idea, no? Well, I, yes, I, I agree with you. I, and I think uh, most people um, recognize that this law would all, almost certainly, well, would certainly, I don't even think I have to add almost, would certainly be understood as breaching the Charter of Rights, that it does breach religious freedom, certainly as we have understood it in this country and as the courts have interpreted. I don't think there's any question. And so that's the very reason why the Quebec government included within this bill um, the notwithstanding clause to insulate this law from charter review. I mean, clearly it breaches at least how we have understood religious freedom. It breaches religious freedom. It amounts to a form of religious discrimination. Now, the, the formal reasons put forward by the government of Quebec in support of this were first that civil servants wearing, or certain civil servants wearing uh, religious dress, religious symbols of different kinds, breach the requirement that the state be neutral. Now, the other argument seems to be that individuals who perform, who had potentially coercive authority, police officers, for example, um, that in wearing religious symbols, they might be signaling a kind of uh, possibility or appearance of potential bias. Those are the kinds of arguments that got put forward. And I think they are, you know, um, well, fallacious. They are just kind of weak and sad kind of arguments, embarrassing. Rational? Yes, okay, a rational being the Which word. Is you the use. word that they throw at the religious side, right? Yeah, and you know, it's plainly, I think, 
personal expression. Somebody might be a police officer, a Sikh man wearing a turban or wearing a kippah. It's clearly personal expression, personal religious expression stemming from most often a sense or understanding of obligation under the faith, sometimes signaling membership in a religious community. I think very few people imagine it's about proselytizing or promoting, and certainly it's very hard to imagine that anyone would see this as state affirmation of a particular religious belief system, since most civil servants are not wearing any religious symbols, right. come from a different tradition, and you have individuals from different traditions wearing different symbols. So it's hard to understand uh, this as the state uh, uh, affirming a particular religious outlook. And of course, there are so many practical problems with trying to enforce a law like this. Uh, what about a beard? What about an Orthodox Jewish woman who wears a wig? Are these religious symbols in some way? Not necessarily. And of course, mm. people can wear beards for a variety of different reasons. There are many, many problems. I mean, I've just stated what I think is the most generous reading of the justification for the law. Sadly, yeah. I think um, it really does stem from an anxiety within the province of Quebec in particular about cultural identity, a fear or anxiety about new communities, new religious communities. And um, I think really sadly, it really sends or carries a message that other religious traditions and most notably Islam are not compatible with the values of the province of Quebec or something like that. Now, I don't wanna to be too critical of Quebec per se, because most polls show that a large, a substantial number of Canadians yes. elsewhere in the country would be supportive yes. of yeah. the law. So yeah. we don't want to direct all our, you know, anger towards Quebec on this question. Right on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was just going to say that for the record, that it's a very popular law, not just in Quebec, but across Canada. Um, and, and this brings us, Richard, to this idea of how ambiguous um, the freedom of expression is. So in your book, Putting Faith and Hatred, you say that while expression is important as a source of knowledge and insight, right, it can also serve to completely mislead or manipulate its audience. And if anyone doubted this before the COVID-19 pandemic, you only have to look at how politicized speech has become in social media. Um, everything from the so-called Chinese virus, right, to um, the, the way that uh, wearing a mask is cast, for example, um, that, that we're politicizing uh, Black Lives Matter in the, in the course of the pandemic as, as to what it stands for and so on. So my concern over here is that if we can manipulate free speech so easily, um, then what are the risks we're talking about when it comes to freedom of expression? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Again, another very large question that I'll try to be reasonably concise in answering. So to start with, I mean, my observation at the, the beginning of our conversation was that when we recognize that the value of free speech is tied up with a kind of recognition that individual agency and identity emerge in communicative interaction, that helps us understand, I think, why free speech is really valuable, but it also helps us to understand why it has the potential to cause harm. Our dependence on expression means that words can sometimes harass, intimidate, deceive, manipulate, or denigrate the individual. Because we are so dependent, our identity, our agency is so tied up with how we present ourselves and how we are presented in the world. Now, a commitment to free speech, freedom of expression, means that the individual must be free to speak to others and to hear what others may have to say without interference from the state. It's often said that the answer to bad or erroneous speech isn't censorship, but rather more and better speech. Right. Now this, this rests upon uh, a number of assumptions. One of them is that individuals are substantially reasonable, rational, and capable of assessing information and ideas they receive. And the other is that they have access to a wide range of opinions and ideas and uh, competing understandings of facts and so forth that they can then assess 
and the claim that bad speech should be not be censored, but rather answered, depends on both of these assumptions, the reasonableness of human judgment and the availability of competing perspectives. But these assumptions don't always hold. And in fact, um, free speech doctrine has always recognized that. Let me just quickly give the very, there's several examples, but most people will be familiar with uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes' example of an, a situation where free speech should not apply, and that is the false yellow fire in the crowded theater. Sure. Of course, in that circumstance, individuals' ability to make an independent, careful assessment of the claim made is absent. The space for judgment is completely compressed. There will be panic in that situation. And so we say, well, that's not protected speech. The audience does not have the space, the opportunity to make a judgment. And in fact, harm will almost certainly follow as a consequence of that. The real problem, and I know you have a question coming up, you've warned me, a question coming up that maybe will allow me to talk a bit more about this, is what happens when these assumptions that underlie our commitment to free speech, assumptions about the reasonableness or rationality of the individual and the, the space and opportunity to hear a variety of different perspectives, what happens when those are eroded uh, are absent in a more, syst uh, more systematic way. That's the real, that's the real challenge I think we're facing now. Um, I, I wonder, Richard, if, if that doesn't emerge in um, what's now become a particularly hot issue, the Danish cartoons. So the French magazine, uh, Charlie Hebdo, republished the cartoons mocking the Prophet Muhammad uh, that ran in the Danish newspaper, uh, Jadlands Posten in 2005, and then again republished them this month to mark the trial of those who had violently attacked the offices of the magazine back in 2015. So Charlie Hebdo claims that reprinting the cartoons is satire, and in light of violent acts by militants who claim to be acting in the name of Islam, though as a Muslim, I'd say they come across as old fashioned gangsters without a clue about any religion. Um, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, defends this as the right to blaspheme. Now, um, at Columbia University, Professor Mahmoud uh, Mamdani has said that this is not about blasphemy, it's just plain old bigotry. And the great German writer, Gunter Grass, says that he's reminded of Nazi-era uh, anti-Semitic cartoons published by Der Stummer. So if we agree that free speech is about a pluralist, democratic society, Richard, do you think such cartoons advance that goal? Okay. Again, that sounds like a loaded question at the end for me, but okay. Now, one of the challenges, of course, with the Danish cartoons, uh, the, the cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, depicting the Prophet, um, were that, of course, as cartoons, there were very different ways in which they could be read or interpreted, very open textured in character. And so that was one of the challenges of figuring out, well, what is the harm here? And there were very different understandings of the harm operating. And of course, as you've alluded to, I mean, one harm that was identified was they seem to reinforce um, stereotypes of Muslims in different ways. Could even be understood as a form of group defamation. And strong objection, as you know, was taken to one cartoon in particular, the mm -hmm. one that depicted the prophet's turban as a bomb. Now, the cartoonist in that case you know, was a little bit unclear about his meaning, but at one point said, no, no, he wasn't trying to say Islam was a violent religion. Religion, it was that some people are, are using the religion as a justification or excuse for violence. But certainly there's no question that that was one of the concerns, that it really was depicting or suggesting that to a, to a, a more general audience, that Muslims held certain views or had a certain kind of attitude or disposition to violence. But the, the other complaint and how it ended up being framed in the courts, rightly or wrongly, was that it was objectionable to mock or ridicule matters that were sacred to members of a particular religious community, in this case, Islam. And certainly that's how the complaint came to be understood by members of the, the larger, broader community. And that raised all kinds of challenges because generally speaking, it has been accepted that, well, attacks on believers, on 
individuals, the members of a group, can be restricted under hate speech law if sufficiently, if the claims made are sufficiently extreme, but mm -hmm. that attacks on beliefs, on the beliefs that individuals or groups hold, have to be open to the fullest debate, including ridicule, et cetera, et cetera. Which is a really um, artificial separation, isn't it? Well, in the abstract, it's not. In practice, it can often be very difficult to say. Especially for a vulnerable group. No, absolutely. No, without question. And of course, I have a few chapters in my book trying to explore yes. how difficult it can sometimes be to determine which it is. But I th certainly think if we understand um, the speech, the cartoons in this case, as uh, mocking or ridiculing or attacking beliefs in some way, then they can't really be subject to legal restriction because the harm is what we would describe as offense. Um, and there is no way to measure what is acceptable and unacceptable offense, certainly in a context where no one was required to view the cartoons. So again, that's something that we could explore fully in another time. Now, let me, let me just say very quickly, a commitment to free speech means that the law restricts only a narrow category of speech. When we talk about hate speech, the courts have made clear it restricts only the most extreme forms of speech speech that denigrates the members of the group, that vilifies them in some way, treats them as subhuman, et cetera. Now, it's important to recognize, though, that just because I have or someone has the right to say certain things that may be hurtful or offensive to others is not itself a reason to say it. And that's why I really found troubling the argument made by a variety of publications, Charlie Hebdo being one of them, who subsequently republished the, uh, the cartoons saying they were doing so to vindicate free speech. Well, there are many ways to defend and protect speech, even that which we profoundly disagree with right. without recreating, reproducing the harm. Yeah, and, and, I, and Richard, I think social media makes it even harder to claim that you didn't have to look at them. I mean, once it's on the net, you're gonna look at them every time you turn on the Google News. Um, it, it's not as if you can constrain yourself from going and buying the magazine. It's not that simple anymore, um, which, which uh, we're running short of time. So I want to come to um, the, the last couple of points that I want to um, ask you about, Richard. Um, this business of social media surely has completely transformed um, how we talk about freedom of expression, both for better and for worse. Um, it's democratized the manipulation, if you will, from mobilizing progressives as well as racists to the rejection of basic science, encouraging vaccine hesitancy. And lately, Facebook and Google and other tech giants have begun taking this seriously, but only under ferocious political and social pressure. So now that everyone has access to all forms of social media and want to say just about anything they want to say, do you think free speech is getting so cheap it's got very little moral value left? Um, I wouldn't put it that way, but I do think that we are faced with a, a crisis, a crisis in public discourse. It used to be understood or assumed and the commitment to free speech rested upon this assumption that the main challenge or problem, um, uh, the main challenge to public discourse was censorship, censorship by the state, and even also, of course, private censorship. But it seems that that may no longer be the principal challenge to a kind of free uh, and open public discourse. Increasingly, the kind of um, spread of disinformation, misinformation, deceit, hateful, harassing speech is a much greater threat, it strikes me. Certainly when we talk about the traditional media, there was a concern that newspapers, broadcasters, they represented a public forum of some kind where a range of views could be offered and individuals could be exposed to those views. But of course there was an understandable complaint that they often, um, it was often difficult for many to access, to express their views on these platforms different uh, perspectives were often filtered out and so forth. And so the internet was seen as 
uh, as remedying some of those, those problems or concerns in which it was easier for individuals to get their views out there, for views that might have been more marginal and excluded from mainstream uh, media to, um, to be expressed and reach uh, a larger audience. Right. But at the same time, what we've seen is the, the lack of filters has resulted in the spread of misinformation and hateful views. Including but, by the state. Well, well yes, and, and that's in itself a kind of problem. Fragmented, a very powerful speaker. Yeah, fragmented audiences mean we see, uh, you know, um, echo chambers, you know, bubbles of different kinds as they describe. And, you know, that's the result both of the choices individual make, individuals make to access material that is all, that fits with the views they already hold, the idea of confirmation bias. It also, it turns out, arises from the way search engines uh, operate, right. the kind of logarithms that direct people to uh, material that fits with and is similar to what they've already viewed. Now, the consequence of this kind of fragmentation has been greater polarization. And it's also, as a consequence, combined with the, the anonymity that individuals can often have online, or even if not anonymous, the kind of disembodied character seems to have resulted in a greater willingness to engage in harassing, uh, insulting material in which there is no, where is often no serious engagement with the other side. It's okay, so Richard, uh, what you just said, that then there is no engagement with the other side, that brings us to um, my, my final question before we go to the audience. Uh, for Q&A. So cancel culture, uh, this has become a, a sort of a rhetorical phrase now for the past month and a half that, that's banded about. Uh, and the claim is that it's driven by ultra progressive, including uh, Black Lives uh, Matter uh, groups and so on, who want to silence those who are seen as less progressive. And the objectors uh, are a gallery of very prominent people. Uh, you see them on the screen, Margaret Atwood, uh, J.K. Rowling, uh, Salman Rushdie, uh, want to claim that there is this cancel culture. Now, Richard, do you think that it even exists against uh, free speech or is it a protest by highly privileged celebrities who are very thin skinned and not used to being not treated like gods? What's your I'm take gonna... on cancel culture? I'm going to avoid your framing of the question uh, for various oh. reasons and say, I don't think there's a simple answer to this question, nor do I think if there is a problem, one can say, oh, it's from the left or it's from the right. I don't, don't think it's as even simple as that. I mean, as I said a minute ago, there is a problem with public discourse. Uh, you know, more and more we seem unable or unwilling to engage with one another. And when we, when we do, it seems often to be in the form of confrontation or attack, rather than listening carefully and taking on board and seeking to address uh, the diff different views that individuals may have. Now, cancel culture is a kind of expression of that idea of our unwillingness to listen to and even sometimes to tolerate uh, the expression of others that may be different from our own. But the fact is that um, there is a significant polarization in public discourse. And the consequence of that has been more and more extreme views expressed in certain quarters and more and more harassment and nastiness online. We shouldn't in fact tolerate everything that's been, that is said out there. We should be sometimes through law restrict as we do with hate speech, but also harassment online that may drive people offline because of the, the kind of bile and experience uh, and, and uh, threats they may experience. I mean, that shouldn't be tolerated. The problem, the problem is that we may have very different views about what should be tolerated and not tolerated. And the one thing that struck me about the Harper's letter, which is referred to here, is that it turned out that the different individuals who signed that letter had very different views about yes. what should be tolerated and not tolerated. Yes. So we're all committed to free speech at some level. We just have different views about 
what is acceptable speech, what should be tolerated. So it's fine to talk about cancel culture, but it ends up how one applies the term very much reflects one's view about what really is the Which is always the case with political rhetoric, isn't it? Depends how you hear it. Um, R Richard, let's give our audience a, a chance to jump in. So Mark, um, what are we hearing? And I'll get out of the way for a second. Hi, uh, yeah, so gets a lively list of questions here. Um, I'll try and pick a few. So the first one is local. Um, so BC's chief health officer, Dr. Bonnie Hendry, has received death threats and abuse in response to her public role on COVID-19. And that's been attributed at least in part to Dr. Henry's gender. It happens to women in positions of power in the public eye. Should the law treat that gender-based abuse as hate speech? Well, I, I mean, if these are death threats, of course, we don't have to think about hate speech. I mean, that's unlawful, unacceptable. And certainly, sadly, it seems to be the case that women in public life, politicians and so forth, get a kind of um, bile and sometimes outright threats that others don't get. And that's awful and shocking. Now, with that said, I mean, just to return to hate speech briefly, I mean, hate speech laws used to, um, used to apply to only certain kinds of um, groups mostly race, religion, and it's not long ago, it's not that long ago that um, sex or gender was in fact included within the criminal code as one of the grounds upon which uh, hate speech could occur. And we have, of course, begun to more clearly recognize, I think as the public, but also through the courts, that in fact, that is a serious problem, hatred directed towards women, misogyny. It turned out that, um, well, there was, there was a, a case in Ontario not long ago concerning uh, Your Ward News, a community publication in which the judge in fact found that the speech was anti-Semitic and was misogynist and breached the hate speech law on both those grounds. We all uh, we remember, certainly those of us in the city of Toronto remember the van attack in North York where the individual drove a van um, down the, the sidewalk and killed a number of people. And then we discovered um, he was deeply immersed in the incel online um, sites, which supported reinforced um, uh, misogynist thinking. So certainly it's a problem, it needs to be thought about. Uh, in the case of Dr. Henry, it's awful and it's tragic, uh, but of course death threats are unlawful in and of themselves. Uh, Richard, if I may, um, briefly, do you think if we also treated it as, as a hate crime, not just say, you know, criminal uh, harassment and so on, um, would, that, would that spark a backlash with people saying, just because we're disagreeing with the provincial health officer on, on guidelines, you're throwing the hate laws at us? Well, again, if somebody's making death threats, that's a different matter. I mean. That crosses the line, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, there's lots of room to disagree with different views put forward around COVID and so forth. I mean, sadly, there's an awful lot of disinformation and conspiracy theories, and we're not sure how to, to manage that. And that's a real problem, and that really points to the problem I was describing before about the bigger threat to public discourse now may not be censorship, it may be the flood of dis disinformation. Because of social media and, and the platform it gives. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So obviously individuals can take issue, it's when it involves the expression of, of hatred and in this case, uh, death threats that you know, it should not be permitted. Um, there's a number of uh, questions about uh, the, the public role or the position of power of the speaker. Uh, so would you agree that the freedom of expression varies according to the role in society of, of the speaker, that um, a head of state or a public figure has a different impact in what they say, and therefore they should have different rights or obligations? And should that apply maybe to groups of people too and their social and economic capital or power? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a fairly abstract idea. I, I'm not sure. Obviously, politicians have a certain responsibility to this point, we have mostly insisted uh, that the remedy, if they have not in fact breached the law, is a political remedy. I know there have been issues about 
Well, what happens when a politician lies? Can they be held accountable for that lie? Uh, as you probably know, one of the challenges around that is, uh, sadly, uh, most of our political discourse has uh, assumed the character a long time ago of commercial advertising and involves spin and um, statements that can be often misleading and deceptive. And I don't even incitement. Uh, well, oh, yes, yeah, I, although I hope not in this country very often, but certainly in different places in the world. Oh, yeah, I mean, somebody in a position of authority who encourages, I mean, as we saw in Rwanda, you know, many years ago now, who encourages violent acts, of course, has a very particular responsibility, and we should be alert to that, most certainly. I mean, anybody has an obligation or duty not to incite violence against others. But of course, individuals in positions of political authority may have even greater uh, responsibility on that front. I guess we have a number of students or people attached to universities in listening. And there are a number of questions about what about groups who deliberately invite hateful or controversial figures to speak at universities? Right, right, right. Well, you know, that opens a large question of campus speech and, you know, let, let and also me... cancel culture. We, we, we're back to that issue. <laughs> sure. But in terms of speech on campus, I think the first thing to recognize that there are a variety of sites of discussion or conversation or expression on campus. So the rules in the classroom, the rules in the meeting room are different than the rules elsewhere. The rules in residence may be different where people live. Uh, the fact is individuals, many individuals work in their employment, often non-academic employment. They should be free from harassment of different kinds. The, the bigger challenge has to do with speech in the public spaces of the campus. To what extent should the rules be the same as speech in parks, street corners, and so forth? And that's one question. And then, of course, what this question is pointing to is when there's an invited speaker. Well, of course, if the speaker engages or is likely to engage in speech that's unlawful, hate speech, then it can be, um, then it can be sh shut down and prevented through legal means. The problem is when individuals consider the speech to be objectionable or offensive, even though it might not breach the law. And again, I have no simple answer for this other than to say, the rules of speech, if somebody has been permitted, if the university allows individuals to invite speakers onto campus, they probably have to be the same basic rules that apply in the larger public sphere. That unless the individual is going to engage in unlawful speech or has a history of engaging in hate speech, it, it can't be shut down. Everybody has the right to protest. Everybody has the right to say, you shouldn't have invited this speaker or, um, the speaker, you know, should not be expressing the views they have, but probably don't have the right to physically interfere with the event to prevent it from happening again. But Richard, again, part of the issue is that you're, you're making a prior judgment as to what the speaker might actually say. I mean, you may anticipate that they will yeah. break the law, but if you go traditional on this, then you can only do something about it after the damage has been done and said now he or she said yeah. that. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, our, our hate speech laws apply ex post facto, after the fact, yeah. that when someone has engaged in hateful speech, they can be charged, prosecuted for that. I do think that on campus, if someone has been invited to speak who has a history of having engaged in hateful speech, and there are indications that they intend to engage in the same practice, the university has every right to prevent or shut that speech down. And uh, maybe this is just the last question. Yeah, or just one end. More. Um, There's a number of fundamental questions, I guess. Uh, what is hate speech? Um, can we trust the government to define hate speech or will that hate speech expand to include criticism of the government? Mm -hmm. Why should there be criminal sanction when people face social sanction? Uh, they lose jobs or friends if they say something bigoted or hateful. Um, I guess there's, there's a, I see a, a number of questions about basically, can you, can you cover the basic, the fundamentals of hate speech? Okay. Uh, quickly, um, Richard. All in, all in two or three minutes, eh? Yes, yeah. okay. as always. <laughs> all right. Well, 
you know, we have, I mean, hate speech law in Canada really takes two forms. The, the primary form is the criminal code, which prohibits the willful promotion of hatred uh, other than in private conversation against the members of groups defined on certain grounds, okay? The listed grounds, religion, race, et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the number of grounds has expanded dramatically in the last number of years. Our courts have said that, of course, that law restricts free speech, but it's a justified restriction. And it's justified because of the significant risk of harm that this speech can cause. The courts emphasize that we're talking about extreme speech, speech that vilifies, denigrates the members of a group. I sometimes frame it as speech that if you took it seriously, you would have to think that radical action against the members of that group was justified. Uh, so, and I think when we talk about hate speech, it's important to recognize that at the core of hate speech is a claim that is false, a claim that the members of some groups are less human than others. And usually that takes the form of a particular factual claim that the members of this group are dishonest or ignorant or tend to be violent. And so at the root of it then is a false claim. If that false claim is sufficiently extreme, say the courts, it can count as hate speech. So uh, as long as we understand hate speech in that way, an awful lot of bigoted speech is still permitted, still happens. Stereotypes and so forth are all over the place. We know that. And they are not caught by hate speech law. A number of provinces, including British Columbia, also have within their human rights codes, um, laws that prohibit, uh, a provision that prohibits the publication or signs that um, can be understood as likely to expose the members of a particular group to hatred or contempt. Now that whole process is a different one and the ordinary remedy if a breach is found is different. It's usually an injunction of some kind to require that behavior cease and desist. Now the main problem that strikes me with hate speech now is how much hate speech has worked its way into mainstream discourse. Hate speech laws probably only work when hate occurs at the margins of public discourse. And we're worried about individuals in these marginal sites encouraging and emboldening one another with the consequence that they may engage in harmful, violent action. A mosque shooting, um, gay bashing, actions like that. As hatred, hateful views work their way into mainstream discourse as increasingly they have in very worrying ways, it's not clear how effective a legal response can be anymore. Richard, we'll have to get you back to, to just discuss that last point about the fundamentals. Mark put that very gently as, oh, a few questions about that, but <laughs> I think it's worthy of a whole session. So we have to close before the system shuts us down. Um, broadly, it seems fair to conclude that a big part of pluralism is about developing a thick skin, as, as Richard was pointing out. There's so much hate speech around in a time of angry polarization. But to say we should now dump any protection from hate speech, of course, I think would remind us of what the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, was throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Um, we need the protections more than ever. And some of us have rather smaller umbrellas than others um, for that kind of protection. So in, in, in closing, my deepest appreciation, Richard, um, for sharing your wisdom and your passion um, and to the audience for sharing your time with us. And please stay tuned for our upcoming episodes. Mark, you get the last word? Yes. Um, uh, so yeah, I would like to thank Richard and Amin, of course, and everybody who joined us. Um, I also need to thank the sponsors of this, the Liberal Arts and 55 Plus program, of course, but also the SFU Center for Comparative Muslim Studies, the SFU School for International Studies, the SFU Office of the Vice President External Relations, and the Ismaili Center, Vancouver. So as you can see on the slide, we have another speak, another conversation coming up. Um, join us on November 14th, Why Can't I Be Where I Want, uh, where Amin Saju will be in conversation with Anchi Ellerman. Um, now this uh, conversation has been recorded. Uh, if you check the uh, Li Liberal Arts and 55 Plus program website by Friday, uh, we should have a link or, or we'll have the recording posted there. The Liberal Arts and 55 Plus program website uh, URL, if you can remember this or scribble this down quickly, is sfu.ca slash 
liberal hyphen arts. Uh, that is all from us for now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And our team. <laughs>